The Weekly, hosted by the editors of Pro Builder and Pro Remodeler, starts now. I'm here with Tim Campert, who is a building performance specialist with Perform at Ibicus uh, in Pittsburgh. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. I'm glad you're with us. And maybe uh, just to start out, give us a little, uh, you know, five cent tour of Perform and, and what you guys do. Yeah, certainly. So we have a group of guys here in Pittsburgh uh, where we travel nationwide, uh, helping builders build better houses. Um, so we walk all their job sites, uh, identify any kind of quality opportunities uh, while we're on site and hopefully get them to change for the better, um, reducing their overall risks. Excellent. And part of what you do also is provide ProBuilder with our monthly quality matters column, which I know our readers really like. It's a great uh, you know, look into specific building materials, different systems, uh, and providing some best practice insight from your experience walking all those job sites. So we really appreciate that, that input from you guys. Um, so one article that you wrote for Quality Matters a while back had to do with truss uplift and, uh, and specifically kind of the, you know, the, what happens if you have that dynamic. But maybe start me out with defining what truss uplift is and, and going into this truss factor that, that you mentioned in the article. Yeah, certainly. Um, so truss uplift, what happens uh, overall when trusses dry out? As we all know, uh, lumber coming from the manufacturers, uh, it's wet. Um, they typically send it out at the highest uh, percentage that they can get away with. Um, so when it hits the job sites, uh, everything gets framed in, it's still fairly wet. Um, so as things dry out, things start to move, um, truss uplift can occur as it dries out. And then once the home overall uh, is drywalled and becomes habitable, um, the overall truss factor uh, from what was written in the article um, happens. So the bottom port of the trusses, actually, since it's closer to the inside condition space, uh, um, has a chance to dry out even more uh, since it has that conditioned air closer to it. Whereas the, in the actual attic itself, the top cords uh, have a higher humidity exposed to it and they can swell um, quicker than what the bottom cord does, um, which creates extra stresses, extra strains in the overall assembly, causing that bottom cord to begin to either lift or fall should things dry out. Gotcha. Okay. And when you talk about wet, you're talking about moisture content in the wood itself, right? So, so they're sending you what we call green or, or like you said, wet lumber for the framers to then use to build trusses. What about, what about engineered trusses? Is it the same kind of thing? I mean, when, when, I'm a, when you go to a lumber yard, or you go to a truss manufacturer and you get engineered trusses for a roof, um, is that typically green as well? It is. Okay. Okay. So that factor doesn't, that doesn't mitigate that much at all in terms of field field construction or, or, or factory built. Okay. No, um, it doesn't. Okay. So, so you've got, you've got a truss that's, that's, that's got too much moisture in it. It's drying out at different levels, maybe even expanding uh, in a different uh, component uh, part of it. So, so how do you address this as a builder? And, and, and basically what you're trying to do is, is reduce the number of drywall cracks and nail pops that occur from, from truss uplift, correct? That's correct. Um, the easiest way to begin to address the issue uh, is maintaining the proper clearance over non-load bearing walls. Uh, that's the first step. Uh, you wanna make sure that when the framers are there framing the interior walls, they're not nailing it to the bottom cords of the trusses, um, making sure that there's proper clearance over it. Uh, minimum you should see is quarter of an inch. Um, ideally from what we always recommend out in the field, it's half of an inch. Um, and then you install what's called a truss clip uh, that allows that truss to begin to move up and down uh, without impeding any kind of load on those non-load bearing walls. And then what about in terms of, of where you want to fasten and even install the drywall? Um, it looks like you've got, you know, the drywall going at the ceiling drywall going all the way to the, to the interior wall or the load bearing wall. And then you've got uh, the fasteners set off a little bit from that, from that joint. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so you should see uh, all the fasteners being held minimally eight inches uh, from those corners. Uh, we always like to recommend to the builders even going a step above that, holding it to 12 inches. Um, that way, should your drywallers come in, you tell them 12 inches, they might install it to the eight inches, um, being it's not perfect, uh, but it's still being held from that corner and it'll allow that drywall 
as those trusses rise and fall, it'll allow it to flex a little bit, reducing your cracking uh, at that corner. Right. Okay, and we're seeing that on the on the lower illustration, lower part of this, where we see the clip actually working and the truss, you know, flexing, and and then that drywall flexing as well. I mean, it, that's is that kind of a an exaggeration of what of what happens, or is that kind of accurate? Is that is that much of a gap can occur when you have truss uplift? That's that much of a gap can occur when you have truss uplift. Um, we have seen where trusses have been nailed uh, to non-load bearing walls where they have lifted uh, at least an inch off the subfloor uh, and you can see up underneath uh, the wall. So <laughs> wow. it's, it can potentially be pretty severe. Okay, okay. Uh, in terms of framing tips, um, talk to me about some of, those, some of those things in addition to what we've looked at or is that really, is that really the crux of it? So there's a couple extra tips that you can do. Um, when the framers frame those interior walls, um, the biggest thing is obviously holding everything short. So it will involve either cutting those walls short um, or working with your panelizer if you're panelizing uh, to make sure everything stays further down. Uh, the other option that you can do if you're still doing a double top plate is eliminating that second top plate and switching to a one by four instead. Um, that way you can achieve the gap without actually having to change the overall framing length. Okay, excellent. So again, as we've talked about some other uh, best practices with, with duct design, with, with fiber cement siding, with all this stuff that you guys write about for quality matters, you know, how does a builder coordinate or collaborate with his framer to kind of make sure this gets done? The biggest thing is training. Um, it comes down to that pretty much every time. Um, working with the guys, making sure they understand why they need to do something uh, is the key element. So really focusing in, making sure they understand they need to maintain that gap there uh, and install the clip rather than toenail everything off. Uh, that's the critical portion of it is really just working with the guys, the individual crews uh, to let them understand uh, why you need to do something. Okay, great, Tim. Again, thank you for your time and uh, be well and we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good, thank you.